part of Oklahoma City all the way to the far west part of Oklahoma City to pick her up, her and her brother, and bring her to church. In fact, the missionette program that ours girls have been coming here on Wednesday nights, Lisa was in the process of that, but her mom had moved in with a guy that just forbid them to go to church. And so the pastor's wife from that church would actually drive all the way to Lisa's house when she got out of school and would work with Lisa on Wednesday so that she would be able to complete this program and be crowned an honor star, even though she didn't go to her church at that time. And as time went by, Lisa obviously had given her life to Christ, and then as she went to college, she kind of got out of the habit of going to church, and it was probably a, a dark, one of the darkest times for her is in, in her development, her spiritual development. And then once she graduated from college, well, this is my version of it. Uh, she heard that I was still single, and so she moved to Tulsa to look me up and to chase me down, and she was creeping on me for a while until I finally gave in and said, okay, I'll take you out. I just said that's my version of it, okay? Her version of it was is she took a job after graduating from OU. Just thought I'd let that ruminate just a little bit just to say those words again. Feels kind of good, doesn't it? Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> just a side note. This won't be on the video because I'll edit it out. My daughter now is enrolled at, at the other school. <clears throat> and... And to support my kids, I have made the, the decision to lay my pride aside, and I'm putting the school uh, emblems on the back of my pickup. <laughs> Sorry. I'm kidding. Okay, I, I digress. I need to go on. <laughs> anyway. So her version of it is, is that she moved here after graduating from school and, and was visiting churches, and, and I saw her sitting in the back and took her to lunch that. It was my day to take people to lunch, and I got to choose what visitors I took to lunch. And so I took her. Remember that, Danny? You guys are probably there. So I took her to lunch, and we've been doing lunch ever since, you know? I waited till 29 to uh, get married, and I've been waiting on her ever since. So it's, you know... It's one of those kind of, one of those kind of things. But I saw in my wife a development that began to happen in her life. I saw a, I saw processes that she went through in her life of coming to know Christ, and coming to deepen the relationship that she had with Christ. She came in as a girl who grew up in church a lot like I did, but had no inspiration or no encouragement from home. And came in, and by the grace of God, he directed her life and formed her life that we could get together. And from that point on, our relationship grew deep, and her relationship with God grew even deeper. And I can say that in the last 22 years that we've been married, that, that I can honestly say that her relationship has progressed farther than my relationship has. And that's not a, a disrespectful thing for me, but I'm just saying it's, a, it's an area of pride for me that I've seen this beautiful girl that has grown and developed and has grown in, in, in the Lord in the same way. Now, me, I grew up in a preacher's home. My father's been a assembly God preacher as long as Moses was alive. You know, I mean, a long time, you know. My grandfather, who turns 104 on September the 1st, pastored an Assembly of God church until he was 100 before he retired. So I come from a long line of preachers. I grew up in the church. I was the kid that was listening to Christian music uh, growing up and, and always just wanted to do that. I wanted to go towards God. I didn't, I, well, I made some bad choices growing up, but not that my parents know about. Hang on. I, need, <laughs> I, I made some bad choices growing up, but they weren't of the variety that would, that would, that would you know, cause issues or problems or shame or, or, or the whole process there. I tried to be the best kid growing up. 
I, I was the kid that grew up and through high school won several people to the Lord. And as a matter of fact, I started doing ministry. I started preaching and singing and doing stuff when I was a sophomore in high school. My sister had her driver's license. I didn't, and she would drive me places, and I would do church services like this from an early age, and I did that all the way through college and just went right on into ministry. So two very different contrasting lives. But the thing is, is that God still loves us the same. And by God's grace, he found this young girl that came from a broken family and brought her to Christ. And listen to this. By God's grace, he took a church kid that had become immune to the things of God and reintroduced him back into who God was in a real and a genuine way and not just a way that I had learned from generations passed on or a way that I had been expected to learn. So I'm saying that to say, listen, I don't care where you're at in your journey with Christ. You may be one that's grown up in the church all of your life. You've never done a bad thing. You've never thrown trash out of the car. You've never done anything bad. Or you may be one here that if we went through your life, you would be amazed at the things that ha have happened. You've, you may still be in the process of coming to know Christ. And that's wonderful. That's what we as a church are here for. But the process is the same for both people. We have to come to a point of knowing that we need Christ in our life, and then we go from there. And can I just say to you lovingly, there are some of you guys who have been Christians way too long. There are some of you that have been Christians so long, if Jesus walked in that door, you would not recognize him, and you'd start grumbling because of the length of his hair or the way he looked. And then some of us, we just don't need God. We just, we're, at a pro, we're just like, why? Why mess with it? I go to church. That's all I need. I show up. I do the thing. I say a prayer. I give a little bit of money in the offering. I'm good. Okay, well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. Are you ready? Four questions. We're in a series called Questions, and what we're doing is that we're just asking questions. We had you guys submit questions, and I'm going to go through and answer these questions the best I can to kind of bring this to the knowledge of what you guys want to know and are interested in. So the very first question, not the number one question, but the very first question, who's got number one? Go. Stand and say it out real loud. Can good-natured people go to heaven? Can good-natured people go to heaven? I can answer this one real quick. Yes, good-natured people can go to heaven, all right? And I hope that ruffled you a little bit because I know where you're going. I think what the question is, is that can just people who are good go to heaven? Or does it just take being good to go to heaven? Well, my first response is yes, everybody, everybody can go to heaven. That's the way that goes. God does not discriminate. He loves everyone and he will accept anybody, but there's one prerequisite that you have to do to go to heaven. One prerequisite. John 3, 3 says this. In reply, Jesus declared, he's talking to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he be born again. That's the only prerequisite that God has to go to heaven is that you be born again. Now listen, I realize that some of you grew up in traditions that being a part of a church got you into heaven or going through a baptism got you into heaven or growing up in a tradition or a family got you to heaven. But the bottom line is, is that Jesus, this came from his mouth. The only way that you can get to heaven is to be born again. Doesn't matter how good you are. Doesn't matter how pretty you are. Doesn't matter how much money you gave to the church. Doesn't matter who your mama or who your daddy are. What matters is have you accepted Christ into your life and have you been born again? That's the one prerequisite to get to heaven. Now, once that happens to you, lots of things change. Some slowly, some quickly. But things begin to change in your life and you begin to see things that are taking place inside of you. But it's not just good people that get to heaven. All right, let me go on. Matthew 7, 21 says this. Not everyone who said to him, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you... What? You... 
What is it? What does it say? Come on, say it louder. You evildoers. They prophesied in his name. They cast out demons. This sounds like church people to me. This sounds like believers to me. They knew the language. They knew what to do. They, they've been in those services when the people were acting crazy and hooping and hollering and raising their hands and doing that. They've been in those services. But Jesus is saying to them, depart from me. I never knew you. Casting out demons doesn't make you a Christian. Attending church doesn't make you a Christian. Being a good person and not cussing doesn't make you a Christian. The only thing that makes you a Christian is that you give your life to Jesus Christ and you become born again. That means that I've given my life to Christ and I've allowed him to come into my life and now I am a believer in Jesus Christ. That's what that means. That's the only prerequisite that he has for you to get in heaven. Okay. Let's keep going. Number two. Who's got number two? Go, Rebecca. Great question. How many of you have ever asked that question before? You've thought about it. How, so three of you. Okay, good. Come on. We've asked that question a lot. Let me go through and explain this to you. I, in, in preparing this, I was thinking, oh, these are great. These are good, easy answers. But the more I got into it, they're a little more complex than they are easy. Let me set this up for you just a little bit. Um, I'll read a portion of it. Mark, the third chapter. We're going to go through and hit quite a few scriptures. So just get your, your Bibles ready, and we're going to flow through these things pretty quickly. I'm going to come down here a little ways and so I can see you guys real closely, okay? Mark, the third chapter, and here's what it says, verse number 22. I'm going to read 22 through 30, and I want you to listen to this portion of Scripture. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he said to his, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went and, and took charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. You'd have to go into that a little bit more. I, I don't, I'm not going to get into that. It's a few verses before. Verse number 22. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub or by a devil. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. And then listen to what Jesus says. There's a key word in here. I want you to see this. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. So the first thing I need to establish is this portion of scripture is not doctrine, it's not law. It's not even, in, in, in that respect, narrative or history. He is giving a parable here, which parable means, the actual words of parable means to come alongside. So it actually is a complement to what he's saying. It's given strength to what he's saying. So many times the parables are used, and in this situation he's using some things that are factual and some things that is, he's using for that parable purpose. Let's keep going. These are red letters. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless first he tries the, ties the strong man up. Now, if we were going to look at this literally, we would say Jesus is advocating stealing. He's saying if you go into someone who's very strong, there's no way that you're going to steal everything he has unless you tie him up and leave him there. Well, that's kind of cruel. That's stealing, isn't it? That's what it's saying. He's not talking about that. He's talking figuratively about going into a strong man's house, which they would refer to as a demon, going into a demon's house or a demon's area. He cannot bind that demon unless he, or he cannot stop that demon unless he binds that demon. And he's talking about through prayer. He goes on. Then he can rob his house. Verse number 28. I tell you the truth. All the sins and blasphemy of men will not be or will be forgiven, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is given of eternal sin. So what Jesus is saying here in this portion of Scripture, we always hit that last one. We know that. We've memorized it. Anybody who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, that's the unforgivable sin. What's the unforgivable sin? It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So we can never do that. Well, how do we do that? Who, how, 
What does that mean to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? So no one knows. Well, look at it in the context of what it's saying. Number one, it was a parable. He was using it. It's not the law. It's not doctrine. He was using it to illustrate what he's talking about in this parable. And his whole meaning is this. And I think it's just an exclamation point at the end of the thing. A demon cannot drive out a demon. He would be divided. And what you're doing is that you're saying that what the Holy Spirit is doing in the lives of these people is wrong. You, as the, as the, the Pharisees and the religious rulers, you are the one that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit by saying what I am doing is not of God. And he wanted them to know God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son are three in one. They are the same people. So by you blaspheming God or Jesus, you're blaspheming blaspheming the Holy Spirit too. And if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you're blaspheming all of them. So we have to stop and get our focus on what's being said here, not on the fact that if we say something negative towards the Holy Spirit, that we're going to lose our salvation and we'll never again be saved. If that was the case, there would be denominations that are going to hell. Because there are denominations that regularly will tell you that speaking in tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is of Satan. In my books, that would be blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Thank you for those amens. Look at Matthew. This is also recorded in Matthew. This this story is also recorded in Matthew, the 12th chapter. And look what it says here. Matthew 12, 32. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. It's the same account. So what you're understanding here is that we can blaspheme God and Jesus all we want, but you blaspheme the Holy Spirit and you'll never be forgiven. In our culture, oh, and let me show you one other thing that it says here. And it says, are not forgiven either in this age or the age to come. Do you understand in that age, they didn't have a full awareness of who the Holy Spirit was. They knew God. They knew Jesus. They were kind of knew Jesus. They didn't understand who the Holy Spirit was because the Holy Spirit had not yet come and manifested himself because Jesus had not risen and trans- went to heaven to allow the Holy Spirit to come down and do his work. Do you understand that? Do you understand that God's major influence, a major impact on the wor- world was from creation not just of man, but the beginning of time, from creation until Christ showed up. Christ's major work and influence on the world was 33 years from the time he was born until the time he died. But from that time until this time, the Holy Spirit is the one who has been doing the major work in the world. And he is the one who touches the hearts and ministers to people and pulls people to Christ. Do you understand that? So in that day, for them to do that was, they didn't really know what they were doing. I love when it says from that day to even in the times to come. Do you know that today of all the Trinity, the only one that people don't, and I'm talking about people who maybe aren't Christians or believers or just don't know any better, those people who blaspheme or say things against God, they will cuss and use curse words to blaspheme God and Jesus, but they don't do it to do the Holy Spirit. Do you notice that? And if that's out of fear for this verse, then it's working. But I want you guys to know, if you ever come to a point in your life that you think you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you won't care. You won't care. I had several years ago, a doctor who was in our congregation was at uh, one of the the Christian mental uh, facilities here, psychiatric facilities here in Brookhaven over here in Tulsa. And he had a young man who had felt like he had blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And the doctor really didn't know how to navigate that. And so he called me and asked me if I would come out and talk with this young man. So I came out and I spent some time with him. And I I talked with him for five minutes or three minutes and understood that he had not blasphemed the Holy Spirit because this doctor really wasn't even for sure what that man and the kid wasn't either. And I talked to him for a few minutes and he told me the whole story and the guy was kind of struggling with some mental issues and at some point he just felt like saying, you know, I hate you, Holy Spirit. And, and at that point he felt convicted and felt horrible and felt like that God had left him and cried out to God and there was still conviction that was inside of his life. And I told him, I said, listen, man, you haven't blasphemed the Holy Spirit because there's still conviction in your life. If there was something that was unforgivable and you'd push God away completely, you would feel nothing. You would feel no love. You would feel no compassion. There would be nothing in you that wanted to get things right. 
And can I say that when we get to a point in our life when we push the Holy Spirit away or push God away or push Jesus away, there is no forgiveness. Let me tell you, listen to this. There's no forgiveness because you will not allow forgiveness in your life. It's not a choice of God, it's just the act of nature. When you push God away, when we tell God we want him out of our schools, look what happens. When we tell God we want him out of our society and we want him out of the government, look at the things that take place and that go on in the world. God is a gentleman. He's not going to be where he is not wanted. And if you come to a point in your life when you say, I don't want you, get out of my life, get out of, forget you, then listen, you are not a candidate for forgiveness because you will not allow him to forgive you. Now, at any point during that process, when you come to your senses, have your pig pen experience or whatever, I want you to know something, that even people who are outside the will of God, God is still directing them and he's still setting things up in their path and he's still putting people in front of them. He's still working things out because his love for you is so intense and is so complete. When Jonah said to God, I'm not going to go to where you want me to go. I am going to go this way instead of that way. I'm going the complete opposite way that you go. And his, his life was falling apart. God put it up in the pea brain of a whale. He put it in there because God still had a plan even for a guy who was running from him. I want you to know that in your darkest places, God is always there. And your sin is never bigger than his forgiveness. Amen. I don't care if you blaspheme God, the Holy Spirit, your mama, your daddy, and Barry Switzer. <laughs> There's still forgiveness. Amen. Let's keep going. Are you, are you guys with me? Okay, number three. Number three. See, you know, it's just fun coming to this church. And, oh, Shauna. Oh, dear Lord. I would have to make that statement right before. Okay. Shauna, yeah, she's one of those cow pokes. Okay, number three, go. If I'm a Christian and I sin and then immediately die without asking for forgiveness, will I still be going to heaven? Great question. Great question. First Samuel 6, 7 is my scripture that I always think of with this. And I wish I had time to expound on this one, and I just don't have time to completely do it the way I want to do. But 1 Samuel 6, 7 says this. But the Lord said to Samuel... Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Now, let me, just to take a few minutes to go into this, because I don't have time to go through all this stuff. I realize that my time is short, and I want to get to the last one. Here's the thing. We sometimes have this feeling, and it goes into confession of sins, and it goes into all that kind of stuff, which I believe in strongly that we have to confess our sins. But there are things that we've done in life that we don't know about. There's things that I've offended other people by my actions or by my attitudes or something I've done or said that I don't know about. And there has to be the grace of God that covers over the areas of our sins that we don't know about. That's why I say this scripture sticks out to me because God looks at the condition of the heart, not just our outward appearance. Now, if our outward appearance and the things that we do on the outside is drastically in contrast to what God is doing on the inside, then God's got some work that needs to be done there and we will understand that and God will understand that. But the bottom line is, is that God looks at the intent of the heart. He knows what your heart is. And if your heart is going towards him, there is forgiveness even for the things that we might not remember. Now, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that we don't have to ask. I'm, I'm not in that camp that believes in hyper grace, that he's, he's forgiven our sins past, present, and future. And that way we never have to ask forgiveness anymore because it would be futile. I read one guy that said, if we ask forgiveness for sins that we've committed or sins in the future, it's useless. It's only for our benefit, not for God, because he's forgiven all of our sins. That's taking the grace of God and abusing it is what it's doing. I don't... I don't not sin because God forgives me. Listen to this. I don't not sin because he has already forgiven me. In other words, my love for God and my obedience and the things I do for God don't come out of the fact that if I do it, God will be happy with me, but they come out of the fact that of what God has already done for me in my life, the response to him and the response to his love and forgiveness in my life is that I am gonna be on my best behavior and I'm gonna do what he asked me to do because I love him. Yeah, 
Are you with me? Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> Fourth one. <clears throat> I want to spend a little bit of time on this one in the... In the awesome question. Okay, did you hear him? Let me, let me repeat it just so you guys can hear it and so we can have it on video. How lenient is God if someone believes and doesn't obey? At what point does it affect their salvation? Great question. Let me just answer the last question first. It affects their salvation the point that they don't obey. Any disobedience to God, whether it be sins of omission or sins of commission, do you know the difference? Sins of commission are sins that we do. Sins of omission are sins that are created because of things I didn't do. It's I omitted it out of my life. So when, when I go and, and yell and scream at someone and when I'm ugly towards someone or when I go and kill somebody or when I go and, and, and cheat on my wife or, or when I go and do it, those are sins that I have done on purpose. Those are sins of commission. I'm committing those. The sins that happen in our lives that we maybe don't know of. Or the scripture says, to him who knows right but doesn't do it to him, that sin. That's a sin of omission. I'm sinning by not doing something. When I see a brother in need and I, I refuse to go to him and love him. Or when I see somebody that I'm going to school with that is far from God and I don't like them and I don't want to share the love of Christ with him. Those are sins of omission. You just thought you was minding your own business, didn't you? No, no, sins of omission. Because the heart of God is for every person to be saved. And when we don't act on that heart of God, we're committing those sins. So through disobedience, your salvation is affected right up front. It's affected quickly. Let me make a statement about salvation. Conversion is instantaneous. You guys ought to write this down, all right? If, if you've got something to write it down with, maybe you should write it down. If, and if you don't, then write it down on Anyway, okay, there, let, me tell you about, let me tell you about salvation. Conversion is instantaneous, okay? Conversion is instantaneous. Justification happens when I ask Christ to come into my life, and at that point, I am made righteous. At that point, I am justified. The, 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 the penalty that was needed for my life, then Christ has paid and he's given to God. At that point, I'm justified. At that point, I'm a Christian. Doesn't matter if you've got a cigarette in your hand. It doesn't matter if you're at a bar. It doesn't matter where you're at. When Christ comes into your life, at that point, you are forgiven. You are going to see heaven as your home, okay? Hang with me. Hang with Some of you guys are looking kind of weird at me. Some of you just look weird all the time, but the rest of you, no, I'm kidding. But here's the thing. Salvation is a process. So salvation is that process of me getting out of those places and learning to follow God. Salvation is the process of me letting the chains of bondage, of, of addictions and things like that fall off me and me follow God. That's the process that I'm talking about with salvation. Now, you can be one of those type of people that are just wanting hell insurance, you just want hell insurance, all right? That's all I care about. I'm coming to church. My wife drugged me or my parents are making me come, and I hear these stories about going to hell and all this kind of stuff. Well, tell you what, I'm going to give my life to Christ because I want to go to heaven. I'm going to live like the devil, but I want to go to heaven. You know, that's like me saying to my wife, listen, I want to get married, but as soon as we get married, I'm leaving, and I'm going to go live with somebody else or move in somewhere else, but thanks for being married because I'm looking forward to that big inheritance I'm going to get from her side of the family, all that money that she's got stored up somewhere that she's never told me about. So when we do that, what kind of a relationship do I have here? What kind of a relationship would I have with my wife if I was just married to her to keep our family together and keep the kids together, but there was no connection here? That wouldn't be much of a, a relationship, would it? I brought this trophy with me today. I keep this in my office. When I was in sixth grade, I was a, a, a pretty tall kid, kind of like Kelson. I, I've, I've always been kind of a tall kid. And when I was in sixth grade, we lived in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and I had played a couple of years with the boys club there and I went out and tried out for a team and they placed me on a team and, and uh, I can remember showing up for the first game and I remember the coach had no concept, we never practiced, he really didn't know what he was doing, he was just kind of like, okay, 
One, two, one, two, one, two. I mean, he like counted us off and said, okay, all the ones, you guys are starting and all the twos are on the bench. And so I remember playing that first game and we won. But here's the thing. I never went to another game. I never went to another game. The whole year, the coach would call me and ask me and whatever reason or whatever happened, I never went to another game. You know what? Our team went undefeated that year. We won every game. And at the end of the year, the coach, being nice, called me because I was on the roster, called me and asked me if I would come to the awards banquet, that awards thing there, there at, at, the, at the boys club. And so I said, yeah, I'll go. I don't remember a whole lot about going, but I just remember going and people looking at me like, who are you? You know, what? Well, I was on the team. And, and I can't remember parents and everybody kind of looking around. I don't know. It didn't phase me a whole lot. I went up and got my trophy. My trophy doesn't even have a little plaque on it because they didn't really know if I was going to show up. That way, if I didn't, they could always give it back to the trophy company. But anyway, I got this trophy. No plaque. It's just a basketball trophy. And I keep this in my office. Because to me, this reminds me of someone who wanted to be a part of the team. I just wasn't willing to make the commitment and grow and develop and learn my skill and be a part of that community. Hello? Is it hitting you? How many people call themselves Christians, but they don't even know where their team is? How many people call themselves Christians and they want to show up for the award ceremony because they want the trophy? but yet they are not willing to grow, to learn the fundamentals, to develop relationships with other people, to learn the process, to learn the experiences, to get better at what they're trying to do. They just wanna show up and if they like it, great. If they don't like it, then let me move on to the final reward and that's gonna be heaven. I want you to know something, folks. Christianity in the life of Christ is more than me just getting out of hell and making heaven my home. So if the question here is, what's the least amount I have to do to make it into heaven? Can I be a Christian and then not obey? You're going to make it or you don't. You dress up when you come to church, you don't. You look nice, you don't. You give in the offering, you don't. You help other people, you don't. That's not the prerequisites. That's out of the relationship. When that happens, when Christ comes in my life, it changes what I want to do. And if the very issue that you're saying, what's the least amount that I have to do to make it to heaven? I'm going to say the least amount that you need to consider is giving your life to Christ because I'm not sure you've ever really done that because when he comes in, he transforms you and puts more want to in you than what you have. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, so, so let me keep going R real quickly here. So where's your heart? I, I just want to ask you that this morning. So, so where is your heart? Where are these questions coming from your life? Just stop and think about that. Am I wanting the fast track? Am I just wanting the trophy without really having the relationship? Do I want to get married because I love the dress and I love the cake and I love everybody taking pictures of me, but I don't want to be in a marriage? I just want the wedding. I don't want the marriage. Where are you at in that? Is it okay for you just to come to church on Sundays but not really pick up your Bible and study and grow the rest of the week? Or do you look for just the minimums that I have to do to get by so that other people will think that I'm the little Christian person that lives down the road or that's in their room or whatever, but really and truly when you stop and think about it, there's not a relationship inside of you. You could take it or leave it. Well, can I tell you, I'm going to invite you this morning to take it because I'm not sure, according to Scripture and according to what you're telling me, that you've actually been born again. In the Bible, grace leaves us with a choice. All through Matthew, as we go through Matthew and look at the Sermon on the Mount, we see these, these choices of two as we go through. There, there were two purities, sexual purity and adultery. There were two treasures, heaven and earth, there were two persons, the blind and those who had sight. There were two masters, God and money. And there were two foundations. There was a, a wise builder and there was a foolish builder. 
As we go through Romans, we also see this dichotomy of twos, and it's usually one versus the other. God, God's righteousness versus, uh, or the wrath of God versus the righteousness of God. Death versus eternal life. Sin versus God, and sin's wages versus God's wages. In fact, in Romans, the sixth chapter, in the 23rd verse, it says, for the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Wages mean death. Sin, or uh, uh, the gift of God means eternal life. So for the question is, is that do all sinners, d- does sin cause death? Yes, it causes death. It's caused death from creation on. The very fact that every one of us in this world will die at some point or another is the result of the very first sin. Sin causes death. Sin causes problems in our lives. And the more we want to go towards sin, the more we see death crop up in our lives. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Here's the thing, God wants every one of you to be saved. There's not a one of you that he wants to punish and send out into an eternity without him. It is his desire that all men shall be saved. And John 1, 12 says, yet to him who has received, um, yet to all who have received him, to those whom believed in his name, he gave the right to become sons of God. There are two scriptures in, in, in the Bible that, that we need to look at. And I, I was gonna draw a little thing out for you this morning, but I don't have my easel up here. But th- there are three things I want you to look at real, real quickly here, and I, and I end with this. I'm, I'm ending again, all right? Here's what I end. I, I want you to notice these three things if you look at Scripture right here. Here's what it says. Yet to all who did receive him, say the word receive. receive. To those who believe, say believe, believe. He gave the right to become. Okay, there's three things. Receive plus believe equals become. Receive plus believe equals become. So when I receive Christ into my life and with my head I believe in him, then I become. I receive him into my heart and with my head I believe and then the result of that is I become. It's a trichotomy. It's my heart mind, and then my soul is redeemed. It's my body, it's my mind, and my soul. Those are the three processes that are in my life, and he affects all three of those. Skip down to Romans, the ninth chapter. It's up on the screen. Romans 9, 10. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Listen, it's the same three. Look at it. If you declare... Okay, that's the same as receive. If I declare with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart, that's the second one, then you shall be saved, you shall become. But here they're changed just a little bit because here the declare says if I declare with my mouth, that is a cognitive thing that I'm doing. And if I believe in my heart, now it's I absorb this into my heart, then I will become. It doesn't matter which order it's in. What matters is that it has to be a change of my head. My head. It has to be a change of my heart, which transforms into a belief system that I have that changes my soul. If my only understanding of God is just a head knowledge, I can read the Bible, therefore I believe that I'm going to heaven. That's not what gets you there. It's got to be a transformation of the head, of the heart, which transforms the soul. For some of you, the longest distance you will ever travel in your life is the 12 inches from your head to your heart. Because if it's just in your head, you won't be saved. It has to come into your head. It has to transform your heart. And then you become the child of God that you need to be. That's the process that you have to go through. So here's my question for you guys this morning. Where are you at with this? Where are you at with this? And I realized, man, I got all those things going through my mind that you got going through your mind. I grew up in this. I've been a Christian all my life. I've been to church. I do this. I give. I've been, I'm an, I've been an honor star. I've been an honor royal ranger. You know what I mean? I've, been, I've done it all. So yeah, I'm a Christian. But you know what? 
What's your life like right now? Is Christ number one in your life? Are all your affections pointed towards parties? Or is all your affection pointed towards things on the internet that you shouldn't be looking at? Or is all your affection turned towards making money and building a business? Where's the desire of your heart? I understand businesses are important. I'm with you on that. I understand that completely. And we probably all need to work a lot harder than what we're working. But let me ask you, is there anything in your life that trumps what God is? Maybe a relationship with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe a sporting event. Maybe it's just your self-pity is bigger. It's the only thing that you can't get past that. Let me, let me just say to you, unless you are born again, you'll never make heaven. I love the little illustration. I don't even have the, the stuff to do it with. I love the illustration that, that a guy said, you know, when, when I was living for Christ, my life was pointed. I mean, when I was living for the world and not a Christian, my life was pointed towards evil and destruction. And I had to make myself try to be good. But as soon as I relaxed, I went right back towards evil and destruction. But here's the thing. When I gave my life to Christ... And when he became number one in my life, he flipped me to being pointed towards him. And now my desires go this way, but I gotta be honest with you, there's sometimes that my desires aren't, but you know what? For me, it's a struggle to try to be bad. I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it. And then when I laid my head on that pillow at night, the tears begin to flow and I say, God, forgive me. I'm going the wrong way. Would you come back and forgive me and take my sins away? I want to be your child. That's the difference. What's the default mode for you and what's the struggle? And then what is your heart saying to do? Go to God or is your heart saying, give it all up and go the other way? If it is, then let me invite you this morning to give your life wholly and completely to Jesus Christ and allow him to be the one who barometers you in the right direction.